Hello everyone and, well, and welcome to the last session of Resilience on Tango. Before getting started, we would like to remind you that for interpretation, please select the globe icon and select your preferred language. Hola a todos y bienvenidos a la última sesión de Resilience on Tango. Antes de empezar, nos, junta, nos gustaría recordarles que para interpretación, por favor seleccionar el icono de idioma en la parte inferior de su pantalla de Zoom para seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. We apologize for the all the delays that we have, have experienced along the way, but it is definitely quite a task to untangle resilience in a in only one session. So, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Cristina Davila. I'm a master in urban planning candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. At, and on behalf of Latin GSD and my fellow organizers. Uh, at Latin GSAP, Latin DOSP, and UPenn's Design in Latin America, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us in our last sessions of our Resilience on Tango. Throughout the day, we've been able to hear experiences from students, professors, and communities engaging with, and also redefining the concepts of resilience. Even though we are aware that untangling resilience will definitely take more than one day, we're also very excited to witness how the public has also brought in insightful remarks in the previous sessions, elevating these conversations and even identifying future courses of actions in their own spaces. Now, in the session called Resilience in Practice, we'll be having Anna Ditch, uh, Rafael Vignoli, Natalia Mosquera, and, for ofi and from Oficina de Resiliencia Urbana, Adriana Chavez, Victor Rico, and Elena Tudela. They'll be sharing their experiences and perspectives on how the concept of resilience shapes their daily practices across scales from the architectural project to the master plan and all the spatial and programmatic actions in between. Each panelist group will, or, or group will have 20 minutes to present as we will then open the floor for questions from the audience. So please feel free to share your thoughts and remarks on the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. Having said that, I would like to introduce our lineup for this session. Anna Ditch is a Brazilian architect and urban designer who for the last 20 years has worked between Sao Paulo and New York, using design to promote interaction in projects that range from the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York to the urbanization of the third largest favela in Sao Paulo. She is currently leading research on the urbanization of the Amazon region and is a principal at the design studio RRC, Arquitetura da Convivencia. She also co-leads the Design for Six Feet initiative and is an adjunct associate professor at Columbia GSEP and coordinates the architectural, uh, traditional architectures platform at Escola da Cidade in Sao Paulo. Uh, and now we also have Uruguayan architect and founder of Rafael Vignoli Architects, Rafael Vignoli. His work spans the globe with landmark architecture structures located in major cities around the world. During the course of his 40 plus year career, he has practiced in the US, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. At home with both large and small scale projects, recent work ranges from university buildings to leading edge biomedical and nanosystem research facilities. Vignoli is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Japan Institute of Architects, as well as the Sociedad Central de Arquitectos. Um, as we also acknowledge the importance of programmatic actions, we, I would like to introduce also Natalia Mosquera, a social worker with a master in urban studies who has worked in several areas of social research, specifically, specifically with Afro-Colombian and indigenous communities seeking to understand the complex formation of the, Lamer of the Latin American region, from ethno-racial processes to building ideas and strategies for peace initiatives and territorial transformations. Natalia is a local consultant for MIT CoLab, supporting the knowledge and network co-creation processes, facilitating and exchanging between local initiatives and the institution, as well as coordinating local logistics in Colombia. And last but not least, I would like to introduce the, a, a collective that embraces resilience even at the core of their identities. Oficina de Resiliencia Urbana is an innovative practice based in Mexico City that brings together a group of high-level professionals in architecture, urban planning, resilience, and landscape. Founded by the Mexican architects and urban designers, Adriana Chavez, Victor Rico, and Elena Tudela, ORU designs and materializes urban environmental integration processes to shape the future of the human experience in regions, cities, and communities across Latin America and beyond. 
by working on projects with tangible social environmental impact through applied research, multilateral alliances, urban design, and landscape infrastructure. With, without further ado, I would like to give it up first for to Anna Ditch. Sorry, hi. Um, should I share my screen? Yeah, sure. Um, is it visible? Great. Well, thank you for um, inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for everyone that is here um, also with us. Um, I, um, I think that um, certain words, um, they kind of acquire a status in a specific um, circle. They kind of turn into a jargon of some sort and start to be overused um, and have different meanings with different people for different people. I think that's what happened with um, resilience um, in our um, circles, architects of architects. Um, and and I, I think that was a little bit clear um, in the um, prior panels. Um, so um, I just want to clarify that in my practice and experience, um, I have approached the concept of resiliency um, from the understanding of how um, nature and soft systems um, could take care of what hardcore engineering could not, because they are adaptable, they are dynamic, um, and they are um, holistic. Based on this um, backdrop, the quest for resiliency in my projects has um, also been closely linked to an effort to understand how projects are embedded in their contexts in an integrated um, and holistic way. Especially now with all the challenges brought by climate change and social injustice, um, I don't think we can afford anymore to dissect the world and keep it in little drawers. In the age of super tech and super specialization, architects have the capacity to make connections and the power to apply knowledge through creativity. And I think this is a very valuable um, asset. When designing, I have oftentimes tried to puncture the surface um, to dive deeper into the embedded layers of meanings and contradictions where I have worked. And in my mind, the urban scape cannot be conceived neither metaphorically or physically without the landscape, the non-urban, its cultural energy and its human capital. And I think we've heard this um, so many times today. Our cities, our built work, our platforms that shape us sometimes not the way we want. And I think should be shaped back by us and need to be shaped um, back by us. When I'm designing, I try to remind myself of these layers and that in one way or the other, I am, we are always um, dealing with them. So um, that said, um, I'm going to show a couple of my projects. I'll try to be um, quick. Um, this is the Victor Tivita Echo Park. It was built in a uh, brownfield in Sao Paulo. Um, there was an incinerator there that um, had been active for 40 years. So the levels of soil and water contamination were very high and the city had ordered um, that the whole site um, should be covered with one meter with three feet of dirt before it could be used as a public park. So my design was based on the opposite premise. Um, what if we exposed the contamination so we could invite the population to know and to reflect about it? I floated a wood deck above the contaminated site, defining the areas of use. The certified wood deck unfolds from the horizontal to the vertical plane to form open urban rooms. And users are invited to learn about the sustainability systems used in the site. The striated gardens were designed over a low tech Brazilian system for self irrigation using a raised floor system that allows excess rainwater to be stored at the bottom, the water is then pulled back by plant roots through the use of coconut fiber. Bathroom gray waters are cleaned through a system of wetlands and used to irrigate the existing trees. 
Plants were curated with examples of specimens used for bioenergy, medicine production, genetic engineering, and soil purification so that people could know about that. The incinerator was de decontaminated and is used for exhibitions um, and classrooms, while the open rooms have been used for many different cultural and leisure activities. A second project, the Greenstream Linear Park, started as a request that a door be opened to this alley that we can see here in Villa Madalena, which is a very dense and bohemian neighborhood in Sao Paulo. We designed the door only to find out that there could be no doors in this alley. It was considered a quote, sanitation alley by code. And a sanitation alley we discovered was meant to protect a body of water. So we went to look for the water we couldn't see. And we found out that Sao Paulo in reality is like a very thin slab of concrete and asphalt over a lot of water. In the old maps of the city, we found a green stream only to see it disappear over time and to be canalized and to become a very big problem. So we got together with the environmental department of the city to propose a linear park over the invisible stream. It became a mile long pathway for pedestrian and bikes weaved into the dense fabric of the neighborhood, taking advantage of the obsolete spaces created by the code and by cars. We hijacked car space to create pockets for leisure and cultural activities. And it was also designed as a, a giant drainage machine to address the flash flooding in the area. Layers of permeable and water retaining material could absorb roughly 20 to 30% of the rainwater, adding, <clears throat> aiding the overwhelmed drainage system at peak times. In some places, the water was made visible, like here, where a new water reservoir was planned. And like in the Echo Park, this project would also call users to reflect about their city. In this case, about the city's water and the hidden rivers under their feet. Well, this project was approved in 2011 and it was funded by the city three different times, but it never got built. The affluent neighborhood at the top of the basin didn't want more people wandering around their neighborhood and they couldn't really care that the neighborhoods below the basin were being flooded with nine feet of water every year. So they used their influence and the city's lack of legal competence to stop the construction. It was frustrating, but looking back, that is when the project really got interesting. To react to this setback, um, we got together as a community from the lower areas of the basin and pressed the city to fight back. For some years, we closed one of the alleys and one of the streets along the stream and promoted several public events and parties. This movement ended up bringing a lot of tourism to the area and several new businesses. We were able to get a couple of abandoned plazas renovated and adopted by the private sector, and we had sidewalks enlarged by the city. And in 2016, we finally got approval from the mayor to permanently ban cars from the street and the alley we had usually closed during these years. This experience was later transformed into a new law in Sao Paulo called Open Streets. And now any neighborhood can ask to have one of its streets closed for pedestrian use during the weekends. There are currently more than 50 streets in the program including the city's iconic Paulista Avenue downtown. The th this third project um, is an Amazon um, eco library and it was designed for a not-for-profit called Vagalumi. For the past 20 years, um, Vagalumi has worked with 250 small communities along the rivers of the Amazon basin. They bring books to the children and they tra train young members of the community to tell stories. This apparently simple intervention has strengthened community organization and involvement and these communities have thrived. 
In recognition of their efforts and success, Vagalumi got a grant from a Swiss bank to build a real library in some communities. My design evolved around the shelves where the books were distributed and used local materials and technology, making sure all parts could be either be fabricated on site or shipped in the small canoes used in the area. The pitched tin roof used in the local houses got elevated to allow for cross ventilation and function as an umbrella against the rain. The typical roof trusses were angled so the unexpected form could stress the symbolic importance of the communal space. But like the Greenstream Linear Park, it didn't get built because the bank pulled out the money at the last minute. And, it, and this is also when it kind of got interesting because the kids of one of these communities, they just decided they weren't going to wait for the funding or the bank or for us to solve the problem. They decided they would use an abandoned house in their village as their own library. So one day I was in a conference in Panama and I received a call, a worried call for, um, from the um, not-for-profits director. She needed help because of the poor conditions of the house they were afraid the children would get hurt. So they sent me pictures of the house. I made some sketches on my lap during a conference, talked a couple of times to a local carpenter who had volunteered to help, and they built it. This led the way to other community libraries and also for us to realize that they were the ones who needed to um, build them and that they could build them. And with the small grants that we got here and there, we did um, 12 of them so far. I would like to finish up with um, my research about the urbanization of the Brazilian Amazon. And I'm going to start with um, a small video. Extensive urbanization is pervasive. It has reached all corners of the globe, including the Amazon. Take the Belo Monte hydroelectric as an example. Its recent construction caused an enormous environmental disaster. And when it reaches its full production capacity, 80% of all the energy produced will go into the production of raw aluminum which will then be exported to Canada, to Japan, to China, to the US, so that Coca-Cola cans can be produced and we can drink one in New York. As you just saw, the extractive industry causing deforestation is supported by an extensive web of cities and villages, causing a lot of damage at a very, very rapid pace. In 2017, I won a grant to visit the five cities in Brazil that had elected indigenous mayors and started to catalog the urbanization patterns in the Amazon. 
But as you can imagine, it's not only about grids and urban indexes. To put it into perspective, let's remember that the Amazon is almost the size of the continental US. It shelters immense biodiversity and has a huge role in our global environment balance, as we all know. It's also supported by an incredibly complex and very, very fragile ecosystem. But what seems to be pristine forest, we now know has been managed by men for probably 12,000 years. New laser technology has detected the presence of human settlements all around the Amazon region, including clusters of villages connected by wide roads, man-made infrastructure like artificial lakes, canal, dikes, and so on, as well as managed forest plantations. Take the example of the circular farming method of the Black River Basin, which is still practiced today. Farming inside the dense forest, these communities have a sophisticated knowledge of what to plant and when, so as to promote cross fertilization by different species and have the forest return in 10 to 25 year cycles. This knowledge is embedded in what I have called a circular culture with a very different imaginary from ours. Concepts of fluidity, ownership, kinship, space, time interrelate to each other and are deeply integrated to the environment around them. In their territories, these communities have been able to better protect the environment than in any other place in Brazil and the world to that matter. So going back to the movie's concept of extended naturalization, I have been exploring this idea of a third landscape and how traditional indigenous practices could inform the urbanization occurring in the Amazon. Explore the idea of a hybrid urbanization that is structured on alternative solutions arising from the encounter of two imaginaries, that of our modern world and that of the indigenous local knowledge. The possibilities are many at the scale of architecture with research to be done about materials and constructive technology, at the scale of urban design and infrastructure, and especially how we can bring our knowledge in green infrastructure to meet the local indigenous and so on and so on. But also this encounter should be a recognition of these other imaginaries that are out there. Maybe it could help us transition to a long-term vision that is not standardized, but is specific, interdependent and aligned with new technologies and relevant to local context. To finish up, I would like to go back to the idea of resiliency and its relationships to an understanding of what the world, um, to an understanding of the world that is less fragmented than our modern industrialized society has made us believe. The idea that as practitioners, as architects, we can put ourselves in a position to question and to respond to the challenges we face today in a systematic, holistic way one that could help communities and ecosystems gain resiliency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for this insightful presentation. Mr. Vignoli, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks for the invitation and and thanks uh, to Anna and to the uh, uh, to the students that uh, that I watch in the previous panel. Um, it is difficult for me to um, forget and um, untangling. I mean, just to tackle the very notion of what resilience is in. In, in, in practice, uh, because resilience is, as Anna was saying before, is this <clears throat> capacity of an object to come back to shape after it has been, after it has been subject to um, deforming conditions of its basic structure. And I think that probably <clears throat> uh, 
the capacity is more of an educational tool or something that could be invested and proclaimed and 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 conveyed to to uh, to people all over the world at whatever age they are and in whatever context they are. Um, what you've been showing so far is a clear <clears throat> indication of something that, that by definition these markets or these countries, Latin America, have been uh, um, uh, invaded by, which is um, a, um, a, a permanent um, perception of um, impossibility to overcome basic tenets of uh, what we call say civilization i mean you know it's it's, it's just is is a is a continent in transition i mean we all come from from it so we know it well and we all have that capacity otherwise we wouldn't be where where we all collectively are and much less um be as happy as the people that were shown in venezuela and in lima and in and in Brazil and in Sao Paulo, after taking hold and feeling empower, empowered by by their own decision to to overcome. I mean, it sounds a little bit like a political uh, comment, but um, perhaps the the only thing that I could contribute to you is um, to uh, describe essentially what is that stress today. In, um, in all the spheres in which we operate, the culture, the development process, health, um, uh, the practice of our craft. And it seems to me that, the, um, that perhaps those uh, subjects are perhaps too wide and too lofty for, for a short presentation. But I think that perhaps a, a brief summary on what are the stresses under which the practice operates today could be of help to to students and to other practitioners and 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 to the audience at large and um, so the stresses on the practice um, are not only just defined by the culture and by by the political circumstances and clearly by the pandemic and the rest of it. But I want to focus on one aspect of it, which is the uh, slow process of um, uh, diminishment of the scope of the profession. And that is exactly what is it that we do, can do, or are um, skill to do, and that has been shrinking. And I have been in practice for more than fifty years, uh, consistently. And uh, that uh, process that started with this sort of kind of idea that specialization was going to save the world and so on, you know, has actually made the practice into a sub-practice to a number of other um, um, actors and that, that really have filled gaps that we ourselves created. And I think that's interesting to explore because in the same way in which it's difficult to build, it's difficult to design and it's difficult to program. And I think that those three things used to be in the preview of what we architects um, used to know. In other words, how to, from how to program to how to build, and how these two things really came into defining the way in which you, we designed, which seems to be perhaps the only category that apparently remains in in our in our uh, scope the problem is that even design design without essentially having complete control of the media that we use that is to say 
our media is construction, is not talking, is not drawing, is not modeling, is essentially building. And we have started to lose a grasp on the control of that technology. It's sort of like if you were a, a sculptor in the Renaissance and didn't know how to how to hit marble or 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 or, or work with with your instruments. And I think that comes from a, a number of um, that that particular laws, the laws on the on the ability to knowing your media is a combination of the effect of a shift in the philosophy of education in architecture that probably started right at the same moment in which I graduated, which was in 1968 or so. Um, and that is, uh, it, that, that became a, a process of rarification of the whole discourse in architecture, most of which perhaps we, you are familiar with and hear later and day out in, in academia and other fields in which the essential component of the transmission of the craft got completely lost. I think that process is, becomes one of the, I think, um, fundamental reasons why uh, that stress is, is presently more than obvious in architecture, in the practice of architecture, in other words, we know less and we claim less. And when we claim more, what we're claiming is the wrong objective. We claim for aesthetic independence, for some kind of um, uh, ability to convince people in an operation which is essentially a, a collaborative effort uh, um, uh, in many different levels that we claim that we have a right over form that other people don't. And I think that that's something which is pretty clear in, in, in some of the work that you saw just recently in the previous section, in the work of the students and also in the images that Anna, men, uh, Anna showed before, which is that essentially uh, the ability to give form is something that is inherent to communities and to people at large and that we somehow have um, uh, brought that into an intersection in which the management of a very complex and very expensive project which is every single construction including you know a a a, a, a construction like the huts that that were shown before in the in the um, aborigines of uh, of, uh, of the Amazon. Um, that process is a process which needs coordination. So it's not that I think that the profession is gone. I think that the profession is under stress, and therefore my only contribution to this is to say that we should think about the origins of this loss of scope. And they are cultural and they have origins. And in my simplistic way of seeing, it has also guilty partners. I mean, you know, I for one can trace the 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 debacle of architectural education over the last 35, 40 years, um, practically day by day. I mean, in in and and I think that that's a that's one factor. The, the if you are on the other end, on the receiving end, on the of the of the process of education, which is to create places of work, essentially opportunities for people to practice, we all have become in a certain way uh, teachers. I mean, the practice is charged with a supplement of informing people coming into the workforce uh, with knowledge that it is beyond elementary. I mean, you know, it's just like um, 
it's like if you were a surgeon and you had never seen blood in your life, kind of. Um, and 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 that is a a a a, a, a mechanism which mostly all, all of us that are in practice and understand that it is fundamental. You cannot practice in a collective exercise like architecture is unless you at the same time teach. Now, what's the price of that? The price is that um, if you think for a minute that, um, that what used to be a fairly stable economic cycle of the profession when the profession was um, a, a um, uh, had uh, sustainability in terms of the financial structure um, that this works against that aspect add to that the fact that the scope has been reduced and the scope has been reduced simply by the same process which is that if you don't know a certain area of what is to be your um, area of concern, somebody else will fill the gap, which is this extraordinary process of multiplication of new consultancies. I always use this argument. I, um, you know, nowadays in, for instance, in residential work, uh, presumably you're supposed to do the envelope and somebody else does the plans. That may sound stupid, but, um, but fundamentally it is. And the, the fact is that by retrieving from the ability to perform in many different levels from exact, exactly involving yourself on the core of what development is all about, which is that it should have a return, culturally, financially, whatever. It should have a return. And without involving yourself in ensuring the possibility of obtaining that retail, somebody else fills the gap. And that process is a process that requires realignment. And that's what I think is interesting now that you mentioned in how one um, in one adapts to this situation, which some people just quit and you know get completely disheartened and don't do anything else and go into I don't know I know people that have gone into uh, administration or or you know a variety of different alternative things, interior decoration and so on and so forth. Um, the mechanism is a, a in other words, I, I don't see you how you can be an architect today if you're not resilient, but it's not something that um, that is uh, uh, beyond exactly what what it is the definition of it, which is that you're hit, you kind of bent a little bit and then you come back and try to understand exactly how to move it. I don't think that any project in design terms has much of a an ability to exemplify uh, what I'm talking about because I, one thing you know I've been told that you wanted to see some of our work which I think is a little bit of a vanity project but say I every project that I've done recently in Latin America has actually gone through an extraordinary <laughs> level of absurdity. Uh, fundamentally for, at least in the areas in which I have been working more often, which is in, 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 in South America and Uruguay and Argentina uh, and in parts of Bolivia too. Um, uh, the work we do claims to be completely um, um, normal in terms of uh, of its uh, value relative to other places of production. I, I, I work, um, you know, in many different places and it is always the same. Some, somehow you don't want to diminish your capacity to say that, uh, that you don't have to justify what you did. I mean, that somehow it's by itself self-explanatory. And I think that that's it. 
virtue that you can only achieve if you overcome the pressures that each place has in, in many different ways. I think that perhaps the most significant uh, uh, aspect or comment that I can make is that if you are going to be in architectural practice, be prepared because it's, it's just the greatest job in the world and an absolute torture. And I think that that's a great thing. If you have that attitude, I mean, you know, if you're shy of that, then you're in trouble. But the most important thing back to Latin America, since this seems to be a a, 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 a a characterization of the whole uh, event around our, our part of the continent. It, it seems to me that it's also important to understand exactly where is the social dysfunction that has created most of these uh, critical circumstances, both in terms of the governmental thing as much as education. Uh, safety, security, health, I mean, you know, the whole thing. And I think that the culprit that is completely consistent all over the place uh, is essentially corruption. And that's a, that's, that's a, a subject matter that probably, hopefully nobody teaches in architectural schools nowadays, but it is exactly one is is the 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 waters in which you're going to swim are complicated and they're complicated for that particular chemical mix which is that purpose and goodness and creativity and happiness and all the rest are completely destroyed by the terrible effect of corruption which in many cases has a a clear origin, historical origin, and and in many others, it's just pure content, contagious. I mean, you know, that people just get into this business of destroying the social fra fabric uh, with a single objective of personal gain. Um, we all know, for what I can see, that that is a is is not a very um, a, a very promising forecast, um, but people seem to be completely attached to it. I mean, you know, all I can tell you uh, as an example of that is that me and a friend of mine decided that um, wanted to donate the building um, to uh, the University of Buenos Aires, uh, Department of Sciences, which are people that have been always underestimated and underprovided for decades. Um, some members of my family um, belong to the to the world of sciences, and then I, it's it, it thought that it, we both thought that it was a great thing to try to build them a building. We building the, we built the building. We paid for the building and we still couldn't donate it. And the reason why we couldn't donate it was because in the donation didn't have an X percent of uh, um, tax that was supposed to be paid to somebody that had the control on the university in that part of the world. And I think that that's that's also emblematic on, on, on this very simple aspect, which is that regardless of what you do, the, if, you, if your work is not engaged into the um, uh, capacity of a community to overcome these aspects of the problem, and by the way, every single project and work that you showed today shows that that is it, not only a, an alive possibility, but a brilliant one. I think that, you know, as an architect, as a practicing architect, it is really um, a struggle. And I think that the struggle, as I said from the beginning, is originated by our failure to educate in a certain way that is consistent to, to uh, controlling our own vocabulary, which is essentially building and knowing that building is expensive and that 
requires involves some myriad of people and and that 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 the constant operation which is really that needs that kind of managerial capacity that architects used to have including the capacity to really as Anna was describing before Mr. Benyon, I think it's interesting, like the points you bring out about how practice uh, and architecture has changed over time, and also bringing up even personal experiences to highlight the challenges we face as architects in, in multiple scales, whether we, whether we try to engage with the public, but also work on the private side and navigate this realm that the build, that the build, that the build environment is dealing with all these stakeholders, but also understanding architecture as a pedagogical practice. Like how how as you gain experience and, and practice, you also feel the need and understand all the richness and the potential uh, there is at the at the classroom at the at the studio workshops where people learn not only from the professors not only learn from the students but also students learn from the uh, from the professors and the communities they engage in the multiple uh, in their multiple phases and processes and on mm. this one, I I wanted to also highlight the importance of knowing the context and engaging with the communities to also in introduce our next panelist, which is Natalia Mosquera, that has a vast experience in Colombia and also in alliances with institutions such as MIT Colab, understanding the potential academia has, uh, has here and can also and can definitely complement your thoughts from her experience in the Colombian communities with MIT Colab. Thank you so much, Professor Ragnelli. Can you hear me? I I was having some trouble to hear yeah. you. Yeah, I think I think I can. You're good. Okay. Please let me know if you can. All good. The floor is yours. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, I, I think I'm not able to see it right now, but let's give it a try. Maybe give it another try to see. It's, it seems that I'm shutting it all right. You're good, perfect. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Christina. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Um, please receive my hello from Colombia. Um, I'm, I'm here. I'm thank you, first of all, I think thank you for, for having me in this important space uh, where you know we have been able to be in touch with different perspectives and uh, possibilities about what resilience is and how you know, it can be applied in different contexts and, and disciplines. So I'm Natalia Mosquera. I'm part of the um, uh, Community Innovative Lab uh, at MIT. And them is just money which is a program that is developing like an alternative frameworks for finance. And we have another program called Just um, Economy, which is a program based in New York uh, that works with different communities in Brooklyn and Bronx. And the work is, also, is focused on people of color and supporting you know, economic uh, development initiatives with um, you know, people of color um, in New York. And there is, you know, our program called Inclusive Regional Development Program, which has, you know, the vision of being working in Latin America, and that currently is uh, is only focused or is mainly focused uh, on uh, the Colombia Pacific region. Two cities. I'm gonna share with you that, like, 
uh, shortly. But yeah, my presentation uh, it is called um, From Resilience to Reparation and Self-Determination. And I'm and I hope that you know these conclusions and insights that we that I'm going to provide today, you know, help uh, us to go deeper on our reflections of our resilience, and also you know getting more perspectives from you know communities at the base about how they see resilience and how you know uh, they have work around resilience and what other perspectives can also be connected to what we understand for resilience and how, as I said before, resilience can be practiced both from, you know, from the academic um, sector and, you know, from the social justice and, and social organization sector that, you know, is trying to change um, the balances of power in our society. So yeah, okay. So um, first, I'm gonna share like more about Cola, which I think is very important. So who we are, as I said, we are a community innovators lab, and our north star is to construct economic democracy and facilitate self determination with communities directly impacted by the transatlantic slave trade to create equitable human flourishing that respects the planet. So how we, you know, do this work? So as I said, we uh, have these three different programs. We are in different places. We are in places where we see that the transatlantic slave trade was more impacted and impact, um, you know, people, communities, territories, regions, etc. Uh, so how we work? So our our main Umbrella is to support democratic engagement and how we do that. So we use the perspective, this framework, the methodologies around innovation from the margins, you know, having the hypothesis that the people who has most experience the, the problems, the challenges are the experts. So they have key insights, key knowledge to solve and to create solutions to the problems that they are facing. So we use link, think, and do. So link, how we link. So we link, you know, stakeholders, students, uh, leaders, initiatives that, uh, that to support, you know, communities uh, that are in something that we call uh, disrupt and it came from uh, a theory that we use that is called Theory U. Um, so, so communities, regions that are in disruptive moments of change. So we work with them to mobilize assets, resources, you know, uh, to promote, you know, solutions that uh, we think should be tied to the perspectives of, um, you know, policies and uh, everything around uh, development. So link and then think. So we create shared analysis in, in with marginalized communities, leveraging knowledge to enable local efforts to build economic democracy. And the other is do. So during those disruptive moments of change, we work with communities, economic and racial um, justice. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna share uh, our like uh, our case um, uh, from Colombia just to illustrate like like how we came with the conclusions that I'm gonna share with you later about resilience and and why we said that we are not working around resilience that we are instead working around reparations and self determination. So our strategy of work in the in the Pacific region that now is a three-year strategy is called Women the Region. And why Women the Region? Because 
after seven years of being working in the Pacific, like implementing the, 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 the Colombian Pacific, implementing different programs of leadership training, building capacity around innovation. We know we have, you know, built like a, like a beautiful network of initiatives and leaders in different sectors, you know, doing different things. So we define that we want to, you know, build or with these people, with this beautiful network, we want to weave what we consider uh, next to them are some of the key um, challenges uh, that need solution in the region to advance economic development, but led by, by you know, but, 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 the, the, but people uh, at the base. So within the region is our strategy, like, you know, that is connecting all of our previous work. And this is a strategy that is currently advancing peace building, reparations, and economic democracy. And in two cities, like this work has like a um, regional vision um, for many reasons, but maybe because of the history of the of the region that has a lot of in common, and the region itself like a, has like a like a own history that connects um, that, that, that that connects the region, the territory, the people, etc. So now we are working in those two cities, Quito and Buenaventura. And as I said, so something that, is, that the, the region share is the history of 500 centuries of uh, history of slavery, colonization, and uh, uh, resources extraction. And at the same time, something that you know, all of the region has in common is the historic fight for freedom and self-determination that I'm going to be sharing more later. So main challenges. Uh, historic relation, historic related regional segregation. So we see that the, the region, the Pacific region is one of the, with the lowest uh, indicators of development. Mm, we found that 60 of a percent of uh, its population uh, doesn't have like access to basic needs as running water, you know, electricity, internet, that kind of thing. Um, and it matched with our history of slavery and racialized economy that conceived the region. That's something that is, of course, common in our region. But it, this is 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 deepen in this in this in this in this region um, because its own history of slavery and colonization and you know people from outside coming to our 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 territory and taking you know basically what is ours and you know no 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 allowing us to think and 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 and, and create our own trajectories uh, of development. So here is a quote from one of our leaders, Graciano Caicedo. He said, what is war for them is, you know, historically we have developed community organization to support life. Now we have to organize community to defend life. This is a quote that is talking about like because in the in the last three facing like a cycle of violence in Colombia. And the Pacific region is one of the of the region that has been most impacted by by those um, conflict. And what is most like what, what is at the center of what's happening here is the fight or the war around resources. Uh, so that's why Graciano shared that. So main challenges are historic regional segregation, racialized economy, uh, the um, need from communities to currently defend themselves from war and from armed actors, and 
environmental conflicts as uh, Professor Anna was sharing in, 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 in the Amazon, um, you know, we have this like, like, a, like a similar, you know, conflict, environmental conflict here in, in the Pacific because, you know, it's a very rich, very biodiverse uh, region. And we have like different interests, you know, around the resources and we have communities at the center of everything, you know, fighting to protect themselves and fighting to, uh, you know, keep uh, working to develop uh, their territory and their lands. But in this context, we have like a lot of, like given the, the context, we have like a lot of opportunities here, and that's why Colab is in the Pacific region working with communities, with social movement, with civic movements. And it is because you know this five hand by this five uh, hundred years of history of you know black and indigenous communities being living there after you know colonization has you know gave us the opportunity also to build our own vision of development. And we have like a class community, the, a clarity of what we want. Just, ju we just need to, you know, the platforms and the opportunities. And, and as Professor Rafael was saying, uh, we need to also to stop corruption, but we have that. So in 20, uh, 17, we have like a civic, uh, like a historic civil strike in the in the in the region, when a civic movement won like a 500 million of dollars that should be used in a fund that is gonna be funding like a key um, projects of infrastructure for for the city, especially for Buenaventura. So we are supporting also that process. And we have like opportunities around, you know, the long history of this communities building its own culture and identity that is tied to a vision of a regional development and regional economy, something that we cannot see separate. That's something that we need to, 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 to see together. And we also have something very important that communities in the region have won, which is we have the 70 law, which is a law that recognizes collective land for communities. Uh, this is a, and, and this is also a, a policy of reparation that was recognized uh, in our last uh, constitution, which is from 1919. Um, so co some conclusions around, you know, you know, supporting this work and, you know, our, our work uh, here has been in, like, in two main um, lines, I would say. So we are working on supporting collective protection, something that we call collective protection in this context of war and armed conflict. In this process, we are supporting like an entity called community councils recognized by the 70 law, who are the, the, um, you know, the organization who manage the land, the collective land that, that, is, that I mentioned. And they said, for example, this photo that is you know, resistir no es aguantar, which is resisting, So we don't want to talk about resilience. We want to talk about reparation and self-determination. And that's why, sorry, just to conclusion, I'm going to be done. Oh, you're good. You're good. Uh, this is, yeah. It's a, you're good. Sorry? You were just having like a small internet delay, but you're good. Continue. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is a quote from Miladi. Miladi is my partner in Buenaventura. She said, we don't want to be resilient. We want to recover peace and organize ourselves and the state to build wellness for our future generation. So why reparations? 
uh, reparations because reparations recognize the historic trajectories of harm, injustice, inequality. So it recognizes that what we are facing today has a long history that needs to be repaired, right? So it also recognized that economy is based on race and gender exploitation, and it needs to change. Reparations, because we need to uh, approach restorative policies that recognize land to communities that has lost them. For example, in Colombia, we have the 70 law. We need to talk about cultural reparations based on the harm and, and community affectations caused by colonization and war. We need education that responds to the territory needs and vision of development. We need own education. We need education propia. Why self-determination? Because community in the region have fighted for the right of self-governance that will end colonization and extraction. We want to own our own destiny. For this dream, we work every day. Linea Cordova, which is, who is other of our leaders. Okay, Car Christina, with this I finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, especially for integrating all the other components we've been talking in this session. Now we're gonna give it up for our last panelists, Adriana, Victor, and Elena from Oficina de Resiliencia Urbana. Hello, everyone. Can you see us? Hello. <laughs> I, I cannot right. turn on my video. Can you help Hello. me? Mm, ask, I, I just ask to start video. Are you good? I'm here. There we are. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. All right. Thanks so much for the invitation. We're very happy to be in this event. We ourselves were students back in 2012 uh, in the Latin organization, so we know what it takes to carry out these, these events. So thank you so much. Um, thanks for also for the introduction and the other panelists. Um, we just want to let you know that uh, Adri, Elena, and I met back in 2012 at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and joined forces whilst being students to put together an application for Mexico City in the context of the Rockefeller Foundation Centennial Initiative, 100 Brazilian Cities, which is, I guess, why we decided to call ourselves that. It was a very new concept at the time, uh, but we thought it, it was an interesting frame, framework of action. Uh, eventually, the city got selected, and when we returned, we each uh, started uh, acquiring experiences in different fields. I became director of special projects in Mexico City's government public space authority. Elena established her thesis seminar at the National University and Adriana joined the Resilience Agency uh, as part of that uh, 100 Resilience Cities Initiative. And then she led the program for medium-sized cities in the Inter-American Development Bank. So after a few years, just to say that, that uh, we, um, we got back together, but having experience in different fields, which allowed us to have a broader understanding of the real challenges for sustainable, fair urban planning, design and implementation in Latin America with all the challenges that entails, including corruption and the other topics that have been mentioned earlier today. Um, anyway, so it's it's important to, to have, uh, to acquire, um, knowledge and uh, from other fields. Today is Earth Day and it's time for designers to confront the big challenges and question really our role in the context of two major issues that we identify, climate change and social inequality. We believe that the design disciplines have acquired popularity in an elite world, but that this has been inverse to their disempowerment and inability to deliver alternatives with the required urgency. As we all know, the Earth is currently experiencing an immense amount of ecosystem degradation, exacerbated socioeconomic and spatial inequalities. More and more, we see events such as wildfires, heat waves, floods, large scale earthquakes, impacts, water pollution, scarcity, among many other issues. Uh, the impacts of climate change, however, might, might hit harder in Latin America due to extreme social inequalities. For example, Mexico that has 11,122 kilometers of coastline is home to 37% of the 
country's population. These communities will be the first to suffer the impacts of uh, sea level rise, coastal erosion, flooding, biodi uh, sorry, biodiversity loss. Um, we know that coastal areas of Latin America and the Caribbean are witnessing urban expansion, so we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, humanity and millions of species are, are facing enormous pressures, challenges, and inequality, all of which have been exacerbated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic crisis. The current global pandemic represents a unique opportunity to explore new domains and scales for designs investment, utility, and service to the world, as Hashim Sarkis, the current Venus Binali, put it one day. We feel that it's essential to blur the boundaries of design with those of other fields of knowledge to expand our agency. Now, uh, Adri will explain a little bit how we understand resilience and how we put it into practice. Hello. We use resilience as a framework to understand multiple timeframes from path to future, different scales, ecosystems, and sociopolitical and economic context. In other words, for us to be resilient is to be able to adapt in a world that desperately needs to change. We explore the agency of design to build resilient communities and positively impact human and non-human lives in a meaningful relationship with the planet. In resilience and practice, we have incorporated the following tools of method training from design and research, process, collaborative approach, the understanding of multiple scales and timeframes, and representation as visualization. In design as research, we work with it's a methodology. We have realized that there's no other choice than to experiment and take risk. But also, we need to understand first, then design, and learn from experimentations, successes, and failures. Within process, we understand that large scale projects require the design of a process, where design is merely one component. But other elements need to be addressed before and after implementation or construction with a comprehensive long-term vision. In collaborative approach, we believe no alternative world would be possible without an ecosystem of designers willing to experiment and collaborate and with technicians, politicians, and decision makers determined to tackle these challenges. Collaboration is not an option, it's the only way. Multiple scales and timeframes. Scaling up architectural thinking incorporates not only expensive spatial territories, but also different temporalities. Multiscalar design processes within complex systems do not end after being plotted or built. They contemplate transformation from the community appropriation, maintenance, adaptability, and monitoring over time. And finally, representation and visualization. The design tools can help communicate multiple complexities to different audiences so as to inform a uh, shared awareness and decision-making process. As Professor Dilip Dacuna says, how we represent landscape leads to the way on how we design. Now, we are going to present you from the city-wide scale to a public space intervention. First, in the large scale, the resilient city perspective and projection of an vulnerable city. It's a publication with the Mexico City Secretary of Integral Risk Management and Civil Protection. The book integrates and visualizes the history of risk in the city in a hidden history. It aggregates research on the construction of risk over time to understand the city's current vulnerabilities, but also recognizes what has been done. Through the segregation and juxtaposition of geographic information at different scales from the volcanic axis to the city, we help the government to understand the complexity of multiple layers that are simultaneously in the city. Now I'm going to pass it to Victor, who's going to present the next project. Thanks, Adri. So this research, uh, medium scale hydric districts was funded by the Mexico Innovation Fund grants through the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University under the guidance of Anita Perez Beitia, who is chair and professor of landscape architecture at the Harvard GSD. So as you all know, uh, the water, well, and as well as in other cities, 
the water crisis in Mexico City is urgent and the city continues to face enormous pressures to redevelop in a more compact and sustainable way. Water management policy is becoming increasingly central to the negotiation between urban development and water sustainability in the city. Historically, Mexico City's approach to water crisis has been either at the monumental scale of great infrastructure or more recently at the scale of uncoordinated piecemeal green infrastructure. So the hydric district is an experimental medium scale urban model that combines decentralized circular water management with the improvement of neighborhood livability through strategies of reuse, treatment, retention, and infiltration. This project abandons the conventional notion of water extraction, pollution, and drainage to understand any kind of water as resource, not waste. And that includes soapy water, sewage, as well as rain. The conceptual design framework proposes three main, uh, main strategies. First, reveal the history. Second, consolidate and expand open space systems. And three, urban water as resource, not waste. These three components are interrelated and can serve as guidelines to respond to the particularity of historical processes and ur urban environmental evolution of a particular area in Mexico City called Tacubaya. It's a historical neighborhood that is in deep need of retrofitting and uh, is experiencing the pressures of development speculation. Also, the hydric district's medium scale can accommodate an urban governance framework that can connect, which is super important. Professor Vignola mentioned this connection element in design, uh, connect urban and water authorities, local communities, developers, NGOs, students and designers in order to consolidate a shared vision for a more water sensitive Mexico City. And finally, uh, the Tacubaya Hydric District can help demonstrate how Mexico City and other dense cities for that matter can advance via aggregation towards a more sustainable and informed water management vis-a-vis -vis the most pressing issues of water stress and climate change. And now Elena will tell us a little bit about uh, one of, um, of our most recent projects in Los Cabos, Old Shade Garden. Thank you, Victor and Adriana. So lastly, uh, I'm gonna talk about the smallest scale that we work with. Um, this is a series of two projects nearby. They're all in Los Cabos, Baja California Sur. Um, we call them shade garden or shared shade gardens. Uh, they were built last year by Sedat, which is the Secretary of Urban and Agra Agrarian and Territorial Development in Mexico's federal government. So they're part of this large scale uh, initiative. The project was built with very few resources with a low maintenance scheme in a very short design and construction time frame of basically eight months, including design and construction. So it was quite a challenge. If you can show the next, um, thank you. Um, so the shade, you can see both sites in purple on the top of the map. Um, so the Shade Gardens Twin Site Project improve microclimate, promote a local culture and environmental identity while mitigating vulnerability to disasters in a marginal area of the city, which is actually outside of the touristic um, zones. Um, and they are also water infrastructures and landscape projects that slow down infiltration and uh, they channel runoff water while articulating a public space with regional vegetation. Um, this vegetation requires little irrigation and help build an, an identity around it since it's very beautiful and the area um, well, does not show it quite well, particularly in these marginalized areas. The structure of the shade gardens, which you can see in these pictures, uh, the architectural uh, building functions as a space of protection from the sun for multiple uses and acts also as a logistical center for collection and sheltering with, su with sufficient energy and drinking water for uh, disaster events. So on a daily basis, the project will function as a public amenity that contributes to enhancing livability and security in a marginal community, as I said, in Los Cabos. During a rain or storm event, the project will channel the runoff water to a series of infiltration gardens contributing to uh, avoid flooding uh, downstream. 
And during events, events of extreme weather, it can act as a logistical center for food, medicine, collection uh, that also allows for coordination between the municipal authorities and the local communities. Uh, the open and accessible public space includes no fences and or closures and it integrates into the urban fabric while accommodating some idea of appropriation from the local community that has used it in different ways which we didn't expect or know beforehand. The construction included recycled materials such as recycled concrete, gravel, and vegetation to provide shade. So that's basically um, the elements that compose the garden of, of shades. And we want to show a video. That's the skate park next to the building, which is also in the shaded area. and the children playground be behind it. As you can see, it's being used basically by night because of the weather as well. So I think we can use the last part of this video to close our presentation. Um, yeah. Inoru, um, well, first of all, we want to thank our team that I think they're, they're watching right now. Uh, Oru would not be possible without our team. Uh, uh, it's a family, uh, it's a, a collaborative effort. We've become sort of a, a collective consciousness. Uh, and we believe that design's commitment is not solely with aesthetics, immediacy, or market interests. Uh, we believe that as designers, we can contribute within a collective framework to have a positive impact on people's and nature's well-being through experimental strategies informed by local communities, specialists, technicians, politicians, and decision makers by addressing new questions and by tackling the challenges ahead in a more integrated way. So now is the time to rethink the boundaries of design and what design can do for us. We are confident and optimistic that design has plenty uh, to imagine and build a new normal for us all, including uh, beings other other than human. So thank you very, very much for your time and we're open for questions and discussion. Thanks, Christina. Thanks. So, thank, thanks everybody for, for, for your insightful presentations. I would like to invite you to turn on your cameras uh, as we're gonna engage in a small uh, debate, also integrating questions that we had in the in the previous sessions and also general comments that have have come through the through the chat i have seen that we have uh, covered important uh, uh, aspects and themes that cover scales but also the role of stakeholders in the built environment so i wanted to incorporate a question that we weren't able to to address uh, a couple sessions ago from ken ismael santiago pagan he said that and I would also add something to that question. Uh, his question was, what is the importance uh, of, of approaching cross-scalar efforts when addressing risk? And I would like to add a reflection, how do you envision uh, these cross-scalar efforts uh, in, in the region uh, from now on, looking all the progress and even the challenges we're facing nowadays? I'm sorry, who is this question for, Cristina? Sorry, it's open. You, we can, you guys can jump in and also uh, complement each other's uh, thoughts too. Well, I, I, I don't know, I can start. I think that, I mean, this first kind of macro scale problem is that we're the world under development, right? Third world countries. Um, so global, um, economies and you know the extraction economy is the the engine that's um, affecting all of what we do you know like you know what we just chain you know just um showed from the micro scale to the macro scale so i think there's no way that we can think of anything without think thinking um in a in a you know a series of, of scales and systems that are behind um and Embed in, embedded in what we're doing, right? Um, and it's interesting that um, 
Rafael um, that Vignoli um, was talking about his experience um, and throughout the years, how the scope of the architect has diminished. Um, and I think that, you know, these things are, are completely related. I don't think it's the scope of the architect that has diminished. I think it's the voice of anyone who is trying to make um, um, something um, tangible out of, you know, an idea that is not um, completely in unison with this macro scale of what, you know, industrialized platforms um, of modernity um, are calling, right? That's my first take. Um, I think another thing to add to this uh, cross-scalar effort conversation is that if you don't understand risk through that lens, you might just transfer the risk somewhere else because risk does not just disappear. So mitigating it, um, requires at least an understanding of systems that is larger than the architectural plot or the urban site uh, specifically. So I believe we do need to understand like larger scales and that definition is also part of the project. And I believe it becomes an interesting um, subject for architects to start thinking about how to set up those scales that you need to understand before transferring those risks, risks or um, generating problems elsewhere. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, sorry, I'm having, okay. I wanted to add that I think we also need like, uh, like to address risk, we need uh, like a multidisciplinary perspective of reality. Um, and I think, you know, from trying to reflect also from, you know, social science, and I'm not sure that, I mean, that in reality, for example, we can separate the macro, the micro skills. I think it needs like a deeper, uh, understanding and uh, I would add that definitely the participatory and collaborative part is it's key like to define risk and also you know understand the history of the place understand the condition of the place who can do that the power relationships it's it's a it's a very important you know perspective to address risk especially to avoid that you know that that risk is going to happen again, or, the, or that or the the thing that you want to address is going to happen again to to the community or region or city. I'm not sure if Adriana and Victor. Can I, I just want to add some like a little note because sometimes you know when I I was hearing that also in the first panel. Um, I had a student at um, the Urban Design um, Studio at Columbia and one of the years, um, you know, we were discussing, I think it was before the pandemic in 2019, we were part of the super studio. So we went to UPenn to see the, um, the Green New Deal conference. And I remember coming back and we were discussing with the students and then one student said to me, but she, he asked, you know, but should we be gone to like law school, right? I mean, there's so many problems, you know, like, you know, the systemic structural problems. And I think that's the other thing about scale. And, you know, I think you have to understand the background and those systemic structural um, realities so that you can act um, whatever scale you can act and, and, and you're willing to act and, and so, and I think now with the Green New Deal, like if you read the Green New Deal, it's just a big macro scale manifesto, right? A very good one. But I think the ones who are going to have to solve the puzzle, it's us. And it's not the consultants, it's not, you know, the consultants are gonna come along, but you know, the ones who have the capacity to make um, this, link and these jumps from different scales and disciplines um, 
it, it, I think it is um, our, you know, profession, not only our profession, but I think we have that capacity um, because we were trained to be generalists. We weren't trained to be, you know, um, specialized. Uh, and, and, and we may lose a lot with that, I think, like Rafael Vignoli said, in, in, in the marketplace and in the power structure. But I think we have that um, characteristic. I agree with what have you said, and I think that we need to blur the, the boundaries of design and the other disciplines and, and to work collaboratively, because if not, we are not going to be able to deliver the solutions with the required urgency. But, but I, I think we need to actually get us out of the drawing sets and, and the presentations and, and, and start making conversations with the decision makers with the communities. And I, I think also I appreciate the, the projects that you presented, Anna. I think they are a very good example of how to approach a community and the skill, empowering the community. I think that's very important. Some projects delete the community and they, some projects also neglect their landscape. And I, I think that we need to change our mindset. Totally, and, and I would add to that, that the larger the scale, the, the more complex. And so I think that as designers, we can put the tools of design at the service of other disciplines, communities, decision makers, because we can represent. And if we are able to represent and visualize these complexities by virtue of the tools that we know how to use, and then uh, maybe uh, informed by science, and maybe teaming up with people that uh, are experts in video or cinema. I think I think this is an interesting topic that was that was touched uh, on a on a previous um, presentation, and it's something that's super interesting to us because many times we feel that the discussion remains in a very close circle of designers, and we need these uh, ideas to be able to reach broader audiences in simpler language. And it's just, I don't know, it's just exciting for us to, to um, it's, it's, it's worrying the situation that we're living in, but it's also exciting to know that, that it, not everything is def defined. It's an, it's an exciting moment to redefine what design can do for, for us and for, for everyone. I mean, that, that includes also top, talking about topics that are very wide and planetary, such as climate change, which I think design has touched, but just laterally, like tangentially. And we believe there are a lot of things that can be done um, as an experimental approach, uh, but need to start happening because we are on the side of that conversation. And as Anna just mentioned, the Green New Deal is a, is, a, is a good starting point to talk about this, how to make those efforts spatial, how to make those efforts happen in territories at whatever scale they need to happen, right? But we need to start engaging those conversations. So we're very happy about this. <laughs> Uh, uh, for this initiative and this event because the, it, it, it sets up that conversation. Well, we would like to thank everybody like the, from this panel and all the panels and the sessions and also to the public for keeping up with us from noon EST and understanding the potential this sort of engagements have in a virtual environment like the one where this hybrid physical and virtual environment we're facing nowadays. So now I'm gonna give it up for Paola Zarate from UPenn to wrap up the session and yeah. That was a really, really great discussion and thank you Cristina for, for passing it over. Um, really quick, just happy Earth Day again to everyone. Um, it was kind of a coincidence that we ended up doing the conference on Earth Day um, on a topic that is so uh, prevalent to, to what today stands for, um, especially in the design practice. Um, so like Christina said, my name is Paula Zarati. Um, I'm a master's student at 
of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania is through Weizmann School of Design. Um, so as this conference comes to a close, we wanted to say thank you again to our presenters for amazing work and stimulating conversation. And again, thank you to all of those who could join us today. Uh, this is an event that has been a dream for some time. And um, Gabriela, Oswaldo, Cristina, Maria Lucia, and myself, uh, we're also grateful that you could participate in this day with us. Uh, we wanted to come together as a collective across these four institutions to be able to present to you um, a diverse perception and interpretation of the term resilience and how the term both inspires um, how the term inspires both opportunity and challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we had over 400 people register from all over the world for this event, and we were able to represent the following countries. We were able to represent Uruguay, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Brazil, the United States, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, and Belize. Um, so we hope that we were able to begin a conversation here with uh, all of you today on the concept of untangling resilience um, and that you will take with you the curiosity and possible inspiration to keep this conversation going beyond this conference. Um, so as the representatives from UPenn, Harvard, MIT, and Columbia, we really enjoyed the opportunity to be able to put this conference together. Um, and we hope for the Latinx groups from these institutions to be able to do this again in the years to come. Um, so once again, thank you on behalf of the four institutions, and we hope that you guys enjoy the rest of your day.